love to carry out punishment. They weren't the creator of the crucifixion, but they were the perfecter of it. And they loved the torture. Every aspect of crucifixion. So while one group was there as a Passover feast, remembering how Jesus and God brought them out of, of, of slavery, another group was there to see a spectacle of death. And it was about 7 a.m. when Pilate heard this, and he asked whether this man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's ju jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at this time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see a sign done by him. A couple weeks ago, we talked about when Jesus fed the 5,000. He crossed over the, 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 the waters, and they asked yet again, can we see another sign? And he says, you don't want to see a sign. You just want your bellies full. I challenged us not to just be at the table being served, but to push ourselves away from the table and to serve. And that's what Jesus was trying to get them to realize that day. But here, Herod wanted to see a sign. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priest and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod and his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at each other in enmity with each other. Again, we see a struggle. We talked about the four Gospels last week and how each one of them kind of categorized differently the entrance and Jesus' entrance into the city. Well, here we see a similar deal where Pilate doesn't want to make this decision on his own. He's already said, even though, listen, you know who I am. You know how I am. I don't want this to fall on me solely. Listen, he's Galilean. Herod's in town. We'll send him to Herod. And Herod was happy. Her Herod wanted to see him. Herod wanted to see Jesus do some great things. But the chief priest, the scribes, going back to verse 1, the whole company vehemently accused him. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people, and after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of the charges against him. And neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, this does not deserve death. Nothing he has done is deserving of death. I will therefore punish and chastise and release him. But this punish and chastise, even though Pilate said he did nothing, was the, the whipping, the scourging. Listen, we've already heard this. If we've been in the church once or twice on an Easter Sunday, we know how brutal it was. Leather straps, spurs of bone, I mean, uh, metal balls at the end of it, contusions and rips and tears for a man who was not guilty. But because you brought him before me and because I have to talk to you and I have to send him here and send him there, sure, we'll chastise him and send him back to you. Surely that will be enough for these people in this crowd. Just a few days ago, I witnessed you cheering him on. Really? But they all cried together. Away with this man and release to us Barabbas. A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. And Pilate addressed him once more, desiring to release Jesus. But the crowd kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time, he, Pilate, said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving of death. I will just punish, chastise, and release him. 
the people would have known what that punishment looked like. They have witnessed it. But that wasn't enough for them. I believe it was the last chapter or the last gospel parallel that we looked at last week. Remember when I told you that some of the people thought that this Palm Sunday event, this triumphant entry into the city, was that of a militant, that their king was finally going to take down the Roman regime. And apparently, when they saw that this was not his angle, surely he's not our king. Do away with it. Church, how often do we come to events in our life, struggles in our life, where we say this very thing. This isn't the answer I wanted. This isn't the way I wanted it. I'll just do something else. I don't like the way my king did this. I don't like the way my God's doing this. I don't like the way he's working this resolution in my life. Just crucify him and be on. I'll find something else. If you open up the newspaper in 2022, that's what you find. Our world is lost. Our world is seeking what they want, how they want, when they want. And in this day, 6, 7 a.m., the crowd is shouting for crucifixion for an innocent man. And a very evil man, Pilate, is trying once, twice, three times to get this crowd leveled. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Verse 26 Roughly 8 a.m. in the morning, as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry behind him, to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. We see very clearly an illustration here. The larger crowds, how is it described? The whole company of them wanted to crucify him, wanted to kill him. But where there were still a faithful few. They said some great that followed him mourning and lamenting at this accusation. We've seen in movies, in that judge, that courtroom setting, a final verdict comes out and you get cheers of acclamation because one family feels that justice has been served and on the other side, tears and weeping because the result that that other person, that other party will suffer. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and those that never nursed. And they will begin to say unto the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things, when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? We see an illustration where he is trying to bring life, but the people are cutting the life away from him. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, Golgotha, when they cru- where they crucified him, and the criminals, one at his right and one at his left, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And they casted the lots, divided his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. Soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering sour wine, saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And the word tells us there was an inscription over him that read, this is the king of the Jews. We see an illustration here where our creator, our savior, his one and only son, whom he sent to this world, 
And he himself even said he came to serve us. Is on the cross being mocked. The nails in his hands didn't keep him on the cross. Even though his body was weak, it did not keep him on the cross. Love kept him on the cross. Love for you and love for me and love for all mankind. He could have very easily stopped. He could have showed Herod any sign he wanted to show him. He could have went back to Pilate and struck him dead. He could have sent down the crowd at once and they would have all fell dead. They wanted to see a spectacle of death. He could have sent a spectacle of death. But love kept him on the cross. Now, roughly uh, 11 a.m., one of the criminals who hung railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Now imagine three criminals, and or two criminals and Jesus. The people saw him as a criminal. The people saw him as a fake. The people saw him as someone that was not who he said he was. Hanging there on the cross, weak and just gasping and worried every breath. And the one who chastised him back just saying, are you not Christ? Save us. It would have taken a lot of effort from him to say that. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God? Do you not see that you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And he admits, we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. There's an argument played out on salvation's crosses. One to the other. And at this point, Jesus is just sitting there saying, this is the world, this is what mankind is going to do forever. It's going to be 2022 and they will still say, but listen, you've tried this, you've went there, nothing's changed in your life, you still have the bad times, you still suffer situations. Why won't he take you out of those if he's truly a loving, graceful God? But the one says, listen, are you serious? Dude, you're hanging on a cross. You're going to die. Do you not see that you're here because of your own actions? And I'm here because of my own actions. But this guy... Dude, we were up there in chains when Pilate was trying to throw him back. We witnessed this whole deal. They weren't blinded by this occurrence. In the one deathbed conversion in all of Scripture, we hear Jesus say, well, first the man asked, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I was ordained into the gospel ministry about nine, ten years ago. There's been a lot made of this walk down the aisle. The raising of a hand, the saying of a prayer. That's not how Jesus witnessed. That's not how Je Jesus testified. Do we see this? This man said, listen, we are due our punishment. I'm guilty. I know you're not. Will you remember me when you cross over into your kingdom? And Jesus, barely hanging on to life, truly I say to you, today you will be with me. We see a picture that it doesn't take an orchestration. It doesn't take a huge play. It doesn't take an elaborate prayer. It does not take anything other than the heart truly repenting and asking Christ, will you remember me? I see that you're not guilty, but I am. Everything I have done, it is on me right now. But you 
or not. Remember me. And Jesus says, I will. I will. It was about the sixth hour. This would be noon. The time started differently. They didn't go midnight to midnight. They went six to six. And there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now here's the crazy thing. I'm a science guy. I went to school. I went to college for meteorology. University of Tulsa tried to push on me. The world was 65 billion years old, right? I know how to answer C in the test and get it right, whatever. But here's the, here's the funny thing. If we would dissect this, the Passover fell on a full moon. During a full moon, you cannot have an eclipse. So the fact that darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour fell was not science. It was the ruler of this world saying, I am in control. And you will try to question it all the days of your life. And you will try to seek an answer. And you will push the real answer aside. But I am still in control. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus called out with a loud voice and he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said, his la- and having said this, he breathed his last. Now I love Luke, the physician. He could have went into much more detail. This chapter could have been 117 verses like one of the old Psalms, right? He could have went into all the actual wording of what they called bleeding from the eyes when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He would have talked about how weak in body Jesus was. So the scourging of 39 whips, not 40, was actually the equivalent of 100 and something. Because his skin was already weak. His body was already weak. He was bleeding from the eyes and his body would have experienced so much torment. But love allowed him to continue. But I love this in verse 47. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. The centurion most likely would face death. He was of Roman. He's like the queen's guard. They don't talk. They go about their business. They are trained in war, death, and torture. This centurion would have been one of the few, the twelve, the six, the eight, whatever, that would have carried on this whole ordeal of crucifixion. And looking upon The statement, Father, I commit my spirit into your hands. And it was over. The centurion recognized the relationship between son and father. The centurion recognized innocence. The centurion would have said this for the first and last time. Because the other two were guilty. Proven guilty. In a court of law, guilty. Witness guilty. Caught guilty. Jesus, through His earthly mission, was not guilty. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breast. (laughs) Yeah. I saw this week for the first time a social media post And it was a weird relationship between someone who was a non-believer and a believer. And the non-believer calls this believer between 2 and 3 o'clock every Easter and says, We got him! And the believer calls back Sunday morning and says, Didn't take long! Now, I don't want to mock what we're seeing here. 
And I could go on a tangent and talk about the believer and this non-believer and the relationship in which they have, and the believer is still trying to live a certain way, but persuade the non-believer to maybe recognize the error in their tone. The very mocking that would have taken place this day. But that's what the people did. They mocked him. Yeah, no more of that going around town. No more promising us that he's going to be our king. No more of, of all of his charades. I bet all the people he healed are probably going to get sick all of a sudden again. Really? Is that our mindset? It clearly was theirs. Verse 49, And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now Luke chapter 23 ends by saying that there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was a member of the council, a good and righteous man. He had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. Now if we go back to culture and we look at the day and age, Passover would have been on Thursday, so therefore the Sabbath would have been Thursday. They would not have been able to go and prepare on Thursday, on the Sabbath. Understand that they did not expect, despite being told multiple times by Jesus, that this would be his fate. Yeah, Jesus had been turned over, but just like multiple times before, they figured Jesus would be coming home. So 2, 3 in the afternoon, they've got a lot of work. A lot of work to go home and put into preparation because they couldn't do it the next day. We don't understand this type of construct because... We did not live under the law. We've had several conversations about this. The law points us to Christ because it tells us we are not enough. It will always and forever tell us we are not enough. But this day, they would have left with such a shock. What now? But the women go to work. Preparing the spices and the oils for his body. And it ends on the Sabbath. They rested according to the commandment. For three years, his close quarters were taught, witnessed, saw what they saw, and now we're confused. Despite having heard that this would happen, still in utter shock that it would. Just like the, just like the walking on water, they see the skies darken. They see the environment, the world paying homage to the Creator. They would have just heard, listen, I can silence these, but then the rocks would cry out. The people are seeing what this Savior has told them. But they were still in shock. Luke 23 ends very anticlimactic. I'm not a reader. I know my wife is. She likes the action and the resolve and the plot and then the ending. It 
if the story would have ended at Luke 23, I wouldn't have anything to preach. I wouldn't have anything to preach. There's a verse, and it was the, uh, it's the very prophetic words in the Psalms. I'm trying to find it, I didn't get it written over, it was early this morning. Sorry, not in Psalms, in Isaiah. 53 verses 3 through 5. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquaintant with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Church, if you desire healing, it's there. If you desire a peace like none other, it's there. Luke 24, which we'll get into this afternoon, is the other side of the rock. That's the title for this afternoon. All the grief, all the spectacle that was death, the political and, and nationalism play between the Romans and the Galileans and Pilate and Herod and of the people who were cheering and shouting and then turned on him. And he died. Yes. They got him. But it didn't take long. And I'm going to end like this. In comparison, our life won't take long. Regardless what we're blessed with. Regardless how we choose each day to live. Our life won't take long. And we have to decide each day, today, if we're going to be the crowd that shouts Hosanna and recognizes Him as the Lord and Savior of our life. If we're the crowd just a few days later that cast Him out on the crucifixion knowing that he's not guilty, knowing that he did nothing deserving of it, but seeing the love of why he did it. I told you before, my dad tells, has told me the Bible is much like a timeline. You have the beginning. You have the law and how to live. You have the childhood and the tantrums and the ups and downs to the people. And then when we get to the beginning of the New Testament, we see the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior. And here we see Jesus going to the death, the cross. It's not going to be long. We don't know when. We don't know how. But I can tell you this. Much like Pilate desired to release Jesus, Jesus desires all to come to know Him. That's why He stayed on the cross. That's why He didn't come down. That's why He had to die. For you and for me. Our sins He bore. Our transgressions He took. And by His stripes, we are healed. 
Carlette, if you'll just play a tune. We're about to go into breakfast, fellowship, because we know that the story does not end in Luke 23. But some of us are going to go to breakfast, and we're going to go on, and we're going to spend time with family this afternoon. We're not going to stay for the 11, and that's okay. I encourage you to stay. But I want you, if God has worked in your heart, if He's telling you today's the day, you need to make this decision. I want you to have that time to do it. I'll be down front. But I'll also say this. If you just need to put some stuff down, if you need to pray for that healing and what that looks like in your life, the decisions that need to be made, the steps that you need to make this week, come and ask Him. He loves you and He desires to know you more. Pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you just doesn't do it justice. I have life because you're love. I have peace because you took away my pain, my shame, my sin. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that in this time you move, and if there are any decisions to be made, prayers to be prayed, Lord, I pray that they come up quickly. And Lord, work a new spirit within them. We've got three baptisms scheduled for next week. Listen, we can add a fourth or a fifth or more. But Lord, just like that thief on the side, without you, our due justice is death. But because of you, we can ask you to remember us when you cross over in your kingdom. And Lord, if we, if we say just that and we believe it wholeheartedly, that we are full of sin and we ask you to come into our heart, live and guide us by the Holy Spirit, I believe we'll hear the same thing. Truly, you will indeed remember us. How sweet that would be. Father God, I pray that you are glorified in this time. Your people getting in your word. Your people seeking the other side of the rock. To not just live, but to live. Lord, I love you. Thank you for your son. Amen. So, obviously, what my mom was alluding to is I've got a family section. And they're all back there. And some of them, some of them, they didn't think that I'm going to do this, right? Because it's been a while, right? So I got to introduce, right? Grandma, the matriarch, right? <laughs> Family of grandma. I've got godmothers and godbrothers and god sisters and god cousins that haven't seen me in years. I officiated that wedding. Like, it's, this right here is my support, and I could break down crying really right now because they know the effort that has gone into getting me here. Trini was really what got me started in meteorology. She was emergency manager in Glenpool area, got me going and chasing storms the right way, right? And not just the crazy, going to go get in trouble way, but the education way. But the way with a purpose, right? We don't do anything without a purpose. I'm going to take a little bit to do this because what Trini taught me was anything that's worth doing is worth doing well, but doing the right way. Emergency management, fire protection, OSU to get properly certified, right? So that we're not just out there to throw water on a fire, I heard Tim say one time, but to help those in the line of danger, even if we are in the line of danger, Right? And I could tell you in the, in the wedding of Landon and Angel, I told them, I, one of the very first ones I did, and I'm like, listen, it was told to me, both of you know this, right? Marriage isn't easy. And when you commit to each other and you commit to God, it doesn't mean things are going to be easy. Can I get an amen if things have been tough? Uh-huh, they're waving their hands. But they've leaned on Jesus. They've leaned on God. They've leaned on the relationship. They've leaned on family and support. 
to get them through. And when we woke up this morning, when we woke up this morning, we see in Luke 24, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they, who are they in this context? The women went to the tomb, taking the spices which they had prepared. We ended Luke 23 this morning in the 7 o'clock service telling you that they had went into the Passover celebration. We had been passed around between Pilate and Herod. And lo and behold, the people, the same people that were shouting Hosanna, God on the highest, this is my creator, was yelling, crucify him, crucify him. My, how quickly things had turned. And the ladies now knew they had to get to work. They prepared the spices because as we talked about this morning, the Passover was the next day. They wouldn't be able to do it. So they had everything ready to prepare and to go back to the body now knowing that they had a funeral on their hands. And they found, when they got there, the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they, the women, were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood there in dazzling apparel. Matthew tells us it's an angel. Mark describes it as a young man. John account says it's an angel. But here in Luke, we see two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you? We go back to Matthew 17, 22. He said, For the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and will be crucified. And on that third day, rise. And they, the women, remembered. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, mother of Mary of James, and some other women that these things had happened to. So they went and they told the apostles. But these words seemed to fall like an idle tale. They did not believe them. I don't want to stop there for a reason. Why would they not believe them? Jesus' ministry on earth included women. The society did not. In that society, in that day and age, a woman's account would not have been able to stand trial. It wouldn't have been accounted as truth. It wouldn't have been taken into consideration. It would not have even been allowed through the door. I love how Jesus incorporates all. I love how he uses the work of the women just like when he was at the feast and they blessed him by, by washing his feet. They're here prepared to do the same thing in his death. Knowing that that was custom and that was to their role, they did not have any issues or qualms with it. They stepped up and did what was necessary. And Jesus used them. One of the very first that knew that what he had said was indeed truth. That he would rise again on the third day. And here we see it. And in verse 12, But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. Folks, the disciples left Jerusalem fearful that they may be next, right? Because one of the very things that came against Jesus in front of Pilate and Herod was insurrection. The rising up against the Roman Empire, against these other empires and powers that be, that their king was going to come in and take over and rule and create a new nation. So now seeing that Jesus is hung on the cross and crucified, these disciples were like, we're next. And they feared that their consequences would be death, just like their leader. They ran. They hid. They lived in fear for three days. But just like to them applies to us, Christ came to them. Christ comes to us. We see starting in verse 13, on the very day two of them uh, on that very day, the two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things 
that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem that doesn't know what has happened? You don't know the things that have happened these past few days? And he says, what things? Church, it is in my deepest heart, my feeling, that in our walk each and every day, he can come beside us and he can do just this. What things are you worried about? What things are you discussing? Do you still live in fear knowing that I'm victorious? Do you still question and contemplate and are perplexed at the fact that I sit at the right-hand throne of the Father? What things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, he was a man, a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified. But we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. There's a lot of times in our life we had hoped for a different outcome. We spoke this morning about they wanted their style of king to come in and kind of rule militantly to take down the Roman Empire. But sometimes, most of the time, God does not work the way we want Him to. He was the one that we thought would redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things had happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels. Who said that he was alive? And some of those that were with us went to the tomb and found that it was just as the women had said. I've kind of got in my notes here as a deterrent. All the single men, find yourself a godly woman. The godly woman that believes, that just steps up to work and knows, that's right, he told us that that would happen. In the event it didn't, I'm still here to work, but now that it has been the case, y'all need to go down there and check that out for yourself. Because he told us, and it's happened, and we were the first to revel in that grace. And these two men, hearing these things are are probably up and down with their emotions, right? They had hoped that this would be their next, their future. What's next for us? What are we going to step into? All the good things that He promised us. And you know what? Listen, it's the third day, and now these women in our company are saying these things have happened just as He told us. Just as stories He told, it's coming true. Some of those who were with us, went to the tomb and found just as the woman had said. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? We touched this morning that, listen, it wasn't the nails, it wasn't the weakness, it wasn't the the guards that kept Jesus on the cross. It was his love. It was his love. Jesus is talking to these two people and he said, listen, we know it was necessary that Christ suffered for us so that we too would be able to share in his glory. In the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interrupted them in all the scriptures and things concerning himself. Now at this point in my notes, I have written that what we see here is the improvement of a core knowledge or a core memory. Jesus is reminding these two, all the scriptures, all the prophecies back to the day of Moses. 
And He'll do that for us. When we lean into Him, we will get an improvement of core knowledge and core memories that remind us that He was there with us in the darkest of days. He was there at the highest of times. And He will forever be there wherever we find ourselves. He stirs up within us devout affections, just as He did with these two men on the road to Emmaus. So as they drew near to the village to which they were going, He acted as if He was going to go further, but they urged Him strongly, saying, No, stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So He went to stay with them, and when He was at the table, He took the bread, blessed, broke it, and gave it to them. We see in verse 31, And their eyes were open, and they recognized Him. Sometimes, if we just knew that Jesus was right here, would our eyes be opened, our attitudes be changed, our perception at the day be so different because God, Jesus is with me. He's here breaking bread with us. He's here reminding us of the Scriptures ever since the beginning of time. But these two men, they spoke about these things. They heard the speech. They were reminded of the verses. But it wasn't until he allowed them to see him and their eyes were open. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? While he opened up to us the scriptures. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Christ came to them. Christ revealed himself to them, and told him, Listen, everything I've ever said was true. Everything I've ever accounted in the book that we now have, they did not. The scrolls that would be passed about, the the word of mouth, what society would have called folklore, is true. It has withstood the test of time, and they now see it. Indeed, the Lord has risen. Those who seek Christ will find Him, and He will manifest Himself within us and to all those who inquire after Him and seek His knowledge. We see in the next portion of Luke 24 that Jesus appears to the disciples. And before I get in there, I want to mention that nearly 5,000 manuscripts exist from the old of old scrolls talking about this account. We've talked a few weeks ago about how do we know that we know that we know though because science is tricky. People are tricky. Loose tongues are tricky. Right? His word tells us we've got to be planted firmly so that we don't waver about by the teachings that come and go. So how do we know that we know that we know? Part of it is faith and believing. Part of it is seeking and allowing Him to stir up within our hearts that burning desire to seek Him. But others, it's written. It's accounted for. History tells the tale of a man who came served, died, and rose again. He presented himself to the ladies. He presented himself to the two men on the road to Emmaus. He presented himself to the twelve and over five hundred more, all seeing him. It'd be pretty hard to not be true. It'd be pretty hard to come from the very city outward, not 500 miles away, not 1,000 miles away, and another story be told that could be fake or false or a folklore. No, this is truth, and it's been accounted for and written about from the beginning of time. Prophesied, put into action, executed, and come to fruition. We see in verse 36, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? 
remember when he was alive, probably three months, four months before this point, he told them, how much longer do I need to stay with you? You've had three years of miracles and healing and teaching and discussing, walking side by side with me. How much longer do I need to stay with you? And here, in the flesh, after resurrection, he's telling them, why are you still, why are you frightened? Why are you doubting? I've told you everything. I've told you this is what was going to happen. See? My hands and my feet. That is it. It's myself. Touch me. See? For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see, that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, and everything written about me in the law of Moses and of the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then in verse 45, Then he, he, Jesus Christ, opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. Do we have trouble understanding what we're reading? Do we, have under, do we have issues understanding how to apply it? Sometimes we do. This is how we don't. We seek Him. We inquire Him. What are you telling me in this word right here? In my private study time, in my devotion time, driving down the road between phone calls or between radio stations or, or songs when something clicks. What is it, God? It's that stirring of our heart. That affection burning within us to make that next call, to make that next visit, to be there in the right time at the divine appointment that He has called us to. But we will be scared and frightened. We will be overjoyed that He speaks truth. And He said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on on high. How many of you think left after that? No. No. I think three years of earthly missions, I think watching Him be scourged and whipped and hung on the cross and speared and taken down and put in a tomb, living three days in fear and being frightened that I'm, they're going to come for me next. When He shows back up and He says, listen, I'm going to give you a gift, another one, but I need you to stay here. Okay. Now today I don't have enough time to get into the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to us. And we're in a Baptist church, so I've got to be careful with that. Plan another day really to get through that one. But I want us to understand that this is not fake. This is not a story. This isn't just made to make us feel good. Listen, these guys and gals went out just as Christ told them to do after this point. They went to reach all the nations and pretty much every one of them were martyred at the cost. You look back on their accounts, they will even admit that, listen, we didn't get it. Why would anybody leave a legacy for themselves to basically say, I was an idiot, I had three years with him, and I did not get it. I need you to understand that so you get it. 
And then they carried out the rest of their life going as far as they could go. Thomas to India. Doubting Thomas to the, to the country of India. Matthew to Egypt, northern, northern Africa. To just be beheaded, beheaded, killed, martyred. Served up to this, served up to that. Guys, it wouldn't have happened. They saw what they saw. They were convicted by it. They were changed by it. And they wanted you to be changed by it today. Prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. Foretelled throughout all time. And now once more, Jesus commanded, just as I had taught. And here it is. And I am back. I told you this morning, I saw something on social media for someone who believes is a non-believer. They identify as a non-believer. They'll call their Christian friend about 2, 3 o'clock, Good Friday, and they say, we got him. And she'll wait until Sunday morning. She'll text her friends back and say, didn't last long. Didn't last long. I love how we finish up Luke 24. It's much better than Luke 23. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And were continually in the temple, blessing God. Much different than the pronouns used. They cried out for crucifying. They turned him over to Pilate. They said, give us the murderer. And now, they rejoiced. They were filled with joy. They saw Jesus die be resurrected, and ascend into heaven on high. And one more verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 through 8. Paul's writing to the, to the people of Corinth. And he tells them, starting out in, I'll, I'll go back, starting out in chapter 15. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it, and you still stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I like Paul. I've talked about Paul. Paul killed Christians. Paul was educated. Paul knew the scrolls. He knew the Pharisees. He knew the Sadducees. He was well on his way to be like a pilot and a Herod in and of himself. But God. But God changed him, blinded him on his road to Damascus. Just as he, he, he joined these two on the road to Emmaus. He may join us on 33 or 48 or 51 or wherever takes us back home. We better be ready, right? But here, Paul is basically telling them, I've preached it to you, it's the good news that saves, unless you went back to believe in something that was never true to begin with. We have yet another example solidifying the truth of the resurrection. How do I know that? This is written probably some 20, 25 years after Christ's death. And Paul is still saying, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said. He was buried and He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve, and after that by more than 500 of His followers. At one time, most of them whom are still alive, though some have died. Paul saying, you don't want to believe me? Go find them. Why would Paul, 20-some years later, say, listen, you don't want to believe me, people of Corinth? You got 500-plus people to go out and go look. 
what Paul was challenging them is how I'm going to challenge you today. If we don't talk about the good things that God does in our life, then other people won't know that God is in our life. And I press on, just like Paul did, if, if God's not in our life, important enough for us to talk about, He's in our life. But when we have conversations, and we take up conversations about God and Jesus, and how He brought us through this point, and brought us through that point, our co-workers, our families, our friends, they begin to question. Oh, okay, but, but, but explain that to me. How do you know it's God? I have a peace that passes all understanding. Right, Miss Linda? In the hardest of times, I just have a peace. I don't understand it all. I don't understand it all the time. But I have a peace that my father is right there saying, you did good. You didn't do great, but there's always tomorrow. Because as long as I've got breath and you've got breath, he's calling us to God. They started their mission in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit came unto them. They have the Father to take it out from there. And it has reached us today. This message cannot fall on deaf ears. We now have our role. We should be filled right here at Freedom Hill Baptist Church. 9914 West uh, Highway 48, right? Did I get that right? South Highway 48. We'd be west, too. Southwest North East. We need to go and tell the world about it. And we need to tell them that it's true. And be convicted by that. So that those that may throw up a red flag or a fault, they come to know. Because if we don't, man, how sad is it going to be when we cross over into glory and we find out Oh, but I thought, you know, the football game was more important. Oh, but I was going to tell, but I had to mow the yard. Life happens, right? Life happens. Life will continue to happen. More bad will continue to happen. I'm sorry. I got to, I got to be the, the bearer. The prophet Jeremiah whom mom says I'm named after, dad says I'm not. He says it's a Western. I don't know. I'm just picking. The prophet Jeremiah had a message. And he had to take it to the people. And he was called the weeping prophet because he cried because all he had to say was, listen, death is going to come to you. And to you. And to you. I didn't pick the message. But you're going to die. It's going to be bad. But let me give you hope that you can live a new life starting with the decision. And instead of just live, you can live. And then when our time is called, glory will be our home. And that's what Christ desires for us. I know it's Easter. Probably not much different than any service we've held before on sermon or on Easter. The other pastors may have presented it better. I, that's okay. I'm not in the competition like that. But my heart says this. I can only plead so much. I can only tell you why I believe so much. I can only show you the Scripture so much. And we have free will to choose. Now all of us here today may say we have a relationship with Christ. And if so, great, we can go back up through and down the aisles and hug and, and know that we're going to see each other again. And if that's the case, then we need to be telling each other and leaning on each other to pick us up when we're hurt. I've preached heavily on that. Being who God wants us to be in this community with our arms open ready to serve. But if you can't say that, we saw in Luke 23, the thief said, listen, I'm up here because of what I did. My punishment is death. 
But he, he is an innocent man. He's an innocent man dying for no reason. Will you remember me? And Jesus says, truly I tell you, you will join me in paradise. I talked this morning, it's not a magical prayer. It's not an orchestration. It's not a playwright. It's not a skit. It's not the joys and jumping up and down the aisles. It's a heart decision that has to genuinely admit their faults and ask Christ to cleanse them and make them whole. And if you need to do that, I encourage you to do that. Make it quick. We don't know what our tomorrow holds. But I know today he has an opportunity for you to ask him and for him to answer and write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Bow with me as we pray. Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, I just thank you so much for an opportunity to be your vessel. Lord, I pray that you're glorified in this moment, getting into the Scriptures, recounting all that you have done, all the truth from the Scriptures, from the days of Moses, all the way through to today. You have never lied to us. You've never forsaken us. You've never led us in a wrong direction. That's our pride. That's our guilt. That's our shame. But God, all the while you're there to greet us. You've come to us and it's just our decision to ask you. Father, I pray that any ear that this prayer falls on, if they need to make that decision, they'll make that today. In your name I pray.